Fahrenheit 451, part two, starting with Montag's apology. Let's see how far we can get. Montag shook his head and got up and drank the rest of his drink. It's time. I'm sorry about this. About what? Me? My house? I deserve everything. Run, for God's sake. Perhaps I can delay them here. Wait. There's no use your being discovered. When I leave, burn the spread of this bed that I touched. Burn the chair in the living room and your wall incinerator. <clears throat> Wipe down the furniture with alcohol. Wipe the doorknobs. Burn the throw rug in the parlor. Turn the air conditioning on full in all the rooms and spray with moth spray if you have it. Then turn on your lawn sprinklers as high as they'll go and hose off the sidewalks. With any luck at all, we can kill the trail in here anyway. Faber, Faber shook his hand. I'll tend to it. Good luck. If we're both in good health next week, the week after, get in touch. General Delivery, St. Louis. I'm sorry there's no way I can go with you this time, but your phone. That was good for both of us, but my equipment was limited. You see, I never thought I would use it. What a silly old man. No thought there. Stupid, stupid, stupid. So I haven't another green bullet, the right kind, to put in your head. Go now. One last thing, quick. A suitcase, get it. Fill it with your dirtiest clothes. An old suit, the dirtier the better. A shirt, some old sneakers, and socks. Faber was gone and back in a minute. They sealed the cardboard of phallus? It's spelled V-A-L-I-S-E. Valis, Valise. I'm going to say Valis. With clear tape. To keep the ancient odor of Mr. Faber in, of course, said Faber, sweating at the job. <clears throat> Montag doused the exterior of the Valis with whiskey. I don't want that hound picking up two odors at once. May I take this whiskey? I'll need it later. Christ, I hope this works. They shook hands again, and, going out of the door, they glanced at the TV. The hound was on its way, followed by hovering helicopter cameras, silently, silently, sniffing the great night wind. It was running down the first alley. Goodbye. And Montag was out the back door lightly, running with the half-empty Velis. Behind him, he heard the lawn sprinkling system jump up, filling the dark air with rain that fell gently, and then with a soft, steady pour all about, washing on the sidewalks and draining into the alley. He carried a few drops of this rain with him on his face. He thought he heard the old man call goodbye, but he wasn't certain. He ran very fast away from the house, down toward the river. Montag ran. He could feel the hound, like autumn, come cold and dry and swift like a wind that didn't stir grass, that didn't jar windows or disturb leaf shadows on the white sidewalks as it passed. <clears throat> the hound did not touch the world. It carried its silence with it, so you could feel the silence building up like a pressure behind you all across town. Montag felt the pressure rising and ran. He stopped for breath on his way to the river to peer through dimly lit windows of wakened houses and saw the silhouettes of people inside watching their parlor walls and there on the walls of the mechanical hound, a breath of neon vapor spidered along, here and gone, here and gone. Now at Elm Terrace, Lincoln, Oak, Park, and up the alley toward Faber's house. Go past, thought Montag. Don't stop. Go on, don't turn in. On the parlor wall, Faber's house, with its sprinkler system pulsing in the night air, the hound paused, quivering. No, Montag held to the window sill. This way, here. The procaine needle flicked out and in, out and in. A single clear drop of the stuff of dreams fell from the needle as it vanished in the hound's muzzle. Montag held his breath like a doubled fist in his chest. The mechanical hound turned and plunged away from Faber's house, down the alley again. 
Montag snapped his gaze to the sky. The helicopters were closer, a great blowing of insects to a single light source. With an effort, Montag reminded himself again that this was no fictional episode to be watched on his run to the river. It was, in actuality, his own chess game he was witnessing, move by move. <clears throat> he shouted to give himself the necessary push away from this last house window and the fascinating seance going on in there. Hell, and he was away and gone. The alley, a street, the alley, a street, and the smell of the river. Leg out, leg down, leg out, and down. Twenty million Montags running soon, if the cameras caught him. Twenty million Montags running, running like an ancient flickery keystone comedy. Cops, robbers, chasers in the chased, hunters and hunted. He had seen it a thousand times. Behind him now, twenty million silently baying hounds ricocheted across parlors. Three cushions shooting from right wall to center wall to left wall, gone. Right wall, center wall, left wall, gone. Montag jammed his seashell to his ear. Police suggest entire population in the Elm Terrace area do as follows. Everyone in every house and every street open a front or rear window or look from the windows. The fugitive cannot escape if everyone in the next minute looks from his house. Ready. Of course. Why hadn't they done it before? Why in all the years hadn't this game been tried? Everyone up, everyone out. He couldn't be missed. The only man running alone in the night city, the only man proving his legs. At the count of ten, one, two, he felt the city rise, three, he felt the city churn to its thousands of doors, faster, leg up, leg down, four, the people sleepwalking in their hallways, five, he felt their hands on the doorknobs. The smell of the river was cool and solid, the smell of the river was cool and like a solid rain. His throat was burnt rust, and his eyes were wept dry with running. He yelled as if this yell would jet him on, fling him the last hundred yards. Six, seven, eight. The doorknobs turned on five thousand doors. Nine. He ran out, away from the last row of houses, on a slope leading down a solid, moving blackness. Ten. The doors opened. He imagined thousands on thousands of faces peering into yards into alleys and into the sky, faces hid by curtains, pale, night-frightened faces, like gray animals peering from electric caves, faces with gray colorless eyes, gray tongues, and gray thoughts looking out through the numb flesh of the face. But he was at the river. He touched it just to be sure it was real. He waded in, stripped in darkness to the skin, splashed his body, arms, legs, and head with raw liquor, drank it, and snuffed some up his nose. Then he dressed in Faber's old clothes and shoes. He tossed his own clothing into the river and watched it swept away. Then, holding the suitcase, he walked out in the river until there was no bottom, and he was swept away in the dark. He was three hundred yards downstream when the hound reached the river. Overhead, the great racketing fans of the helicopters hovered. A storm of light fell upon the river, and Montag dived under the great illumination, as if the sun had broken the clouds. He felt the river pull him further on its way, into darkness. Then the light switched back to the land. The helicopters swerved over the city again as if they had picked up another trail. They were gone. The hound was gone. Now there was only the cold river and, Ma and Montag floating in a sudden peacefulness, away from the city and the lights and the chase, away from everything. He felt as if he had left a, a stage behind and many actors. He felt as if he had left the great seance and all the murmuring ghosts. He was moving from an unreality that was frightening into a reality that was unreal because it was new. The black land slid by, and he was going to the country among the hills. For the first time in a dozen years, the stars were coming out above him, in great processions of wheeling fire. He saw a great juggernaut of stars form in the sky, and threaten to roll over and crush him. He floated on his back when the valise filled and sank. The river was mild and leisurely. 
going away from the people who ate shadows for breakfast and steam for lunch and vapors for supper. The river was very real. It held him comfortably and gave him the time at last to leisure, to consider this month, this year, and a lifetime of years. He listened to his heart slow. His thoughts stopped rushing with his blood. He saw the moon low in the sky now. The moon there and the light of the moon caused by what? By the sun, of course. And what lights the sun? Its own fire. And the sun goes on day after day, burning and burning. The sun and time. The sun and time and burning. Burning. The river bobbled him along gently. Burning. The sun and every clock on the earth. It all came together and became a single thing in his mind. After a long time floating on the land and a short time floating in the river, he knew why he must never burn again in his life. The sun burned every day. It burned time. The world rushed in a circle and turned on its axis, and time was busy burning the years and the people away. The people anyway, without any help from him. So if he burnt things with the firemen and the sun burnt time, that meant everything burned. One of them had to stop burning. The sun wouldn't, certainly. So it looked as if it had to be Montag, and the people he had worked with until a, short few, until a few short hours ago. Somewhere the saving and putting away had to begin again, and someone had to do the saving and keeping one way or another, in the book, in books, in records, in people's heads, any way at all so long as it was safe. Free from moths, silverfish, rust and dry rot, and men with matches. The world was full of burning of all types and sizes. <clears throat> now the guild of the asbestos weaver must open shop very soon. He felt his heel bump land, touch pebbles and rocks, scrape sand. The river had moved him toward shore. He looked in at the great black creature without eyes or light, without shape, with only a size that went a thousand miles without wanting to stop, with its grass hills and forests that were waiting for him. He hesitated to leave the comforting flow of the water. He expected the hound there. <clears throat> Suddenly, the trees might blow under a great wind of helicopters. But there was only the normal autumn wind high up, going by like another river. Why wasn't the hound running? Why had the search veered inland? Montag listened. Nothing. Nothing. Millie, he thought. All this country here, listen to it. Nothing and nothing. So much silence, Millie. I wonder how you'd take it. Would you shout, shut up, shut up? Millie, Millie. And he was sad. Millie was not here, and the hound was not here, but the dry smell of hay blowing from some distant field put Montag on the land. He remembered a farm he had visited when he was very young. One of the rare times he had discovered that somewhere behind the seven veils of unreality, Beyond the walls of parlors and beyond the tin moat of the city, cows chewed grass, and pigs sat in warm ponds at noon, and dogs barked after white sheep on a hill. Now the dry smell of hay, the motion of the waters, made him think of sleeping in fresh hay in a lonely barn away from the loud highways, behind a quiet farmhouse and under an ancient windmill that whirred like the sound of the passing years overhead. He lay in the high barn loft all night, listening to distant animals and insects and trees, the little motions and stirrings. <clears throat> During the night, he thought below the loft, he would hear a sound like feet moving, perhaps. He would tense and sit up the sound would move away. He would lie back and look out of the loft window, very late in the night, and see the lights go out in the farmhouse itself, 
until a very young and beautiful woman would sit in an unlit window, braiding her hair. It would be hard to see her, but her face would be like the face of the girl so long ago in his past now, so very long ago. The girl who had known the weather and had never been burned by the fireflies. The girl who had known what dandelions meant rubbed off on your chin. Then she would be gone from the warm window and appear again upstairs in her moon-whitened room. And then to the sound of death, the sound of the jets cutting the sky into two black pieces beyond the horizon, he would lie in the loft, hidden and safe, watching those strange new stars over the rim of the earth, fleeting from the soft color of dawn. In the morning, he would not have needed sleep, for all the warm odors and sights of a complete country night would have rested and slept him while his eyes were wide and his mouth, when he thought to test it, was half a smile. And there at the bottom of the hayloft stair waiting for him would be the incredible thing. He would step carefully down in the pink light of early morning, so fully aware of the world that he would be afraid and stand over the small miracle and at last bend to touch it. A cool, a cool glass of fresh milk, and a few apples and pears laid at the foot of the steps. This was all he wanted now. Some sign that the immense world would accept him, and give him the long time needed to think all the things that must be thought. A glass of milk, an apple, a pear. He stepped from the river. The land rushed at him, a tidal wave. He was crushed by darkness and the look of the country, and the million odors on a wind that iced his body. He fell back under the breaking cur curve of darkness and sound and smell, his ears roaring. He whirled. The stars poured over his sight like flaming meteors. He wanted to plunge in the river again and let it idle him to safety on, on down somewhere and idle him safely on down somewhere this dark land rising was like that day in his childhood swimming when from nowhere the largest wave in the history of remembering slammed him down in salt mud and green darkness water burning mouth and nose retching his stomach screaming too much water too much land out of the black wall before him a whisper a shape. In the shape, two eyes. The night looking at him. The forest seeing him. <clears throat> the hound. After all the running and rushing and sweating it out and half drowning, to come this far, work this hard, and think yourself safe and sigh with relief, and come out on the land at last only to find the hound. Montag gave one last agonized shout, as if this were too much for any man. The shape exploded away. The eyes vanished. The leaf piles flew up in a dry shower. Montag was alone in the wilderness. A deer. He smelled the heavy musk-like perfume mingled with blood and the gummed exhalation of the animal's breath. All cardamom and moss and ragweed odor in this huge night where the trees ran at him, pulled away, ran, pulled away, to the pulse of the heart behind his eyes. There must have been a billion leaves on the land. He waited in them, a dry river smelling of hot cloves and warm dust. And the other smells. There was a smell like a cut potato from all the land raw and cold and white from having the moon on it most of the night. There was a smell like pickles from a bottle and a smell like parsley on the table at home. There was a faint yellow odor like mustard from a jar. There was a smell like carnations from the yard next door. He put down his hand and felt a weed rise up like a child brushing him. His fingers smelled of licorice. He stood breathing, and the more he breathed the land in, the more he was filled up with all the details of the land. He was not empty. There was more than enough here to fill him. 
there would always be more than enough. He walked in a shallow tide of leaves, stumbling, and in the middle of the strangeness, a familiarity. His foot hit something that rang dully. He moved his hand on the ground, a yard this way, a yard that. The railroad track. The track that came out of the city and rusted across the land, through forests and woods, deserted now by the river. Here was the path to wherever he was going. Here was the single familiar thing, the magic charm he might need a little while to touch, to feel beneath his feet as he moved on in, into the bramble bushes and the lakes of smelling and feeling and touching. Among the whispers and the blowing down of leaves, he walked on the track, and he was surprised to learn how certain he was, he suddenly was, of a single fact he could not prove. Once, long ago, Clarice had walked here, where he was walking now. Half an hour later, cold and moving carefully on the tracks, fully aware of his entire body, his face, his mouth, his eyes stuffed with blackness, his ears stuffed with sound, his legs pricked with burrs and nettles, he saw the fire ahead. The fire was gone, then back again like a winking eye. He stopped, afraid he might blow the fire out with a single breath. But the fire was there, and he approached warily, from a long way off. It took the better part of fifteen minutes before he drew very close indeed to it, and then he stood looking at it from cover. That small motion, the white and red color, a strange fire because it meant a different thing to him. It was not burning, it was warming. He saw many hands held to its warmth. Hands without arms, hidden in darkness. Above the hands, motionless faces that were only moved and tossed and flickered with firelight. He hadn't known fire could look this way. He had never thought in his life that it could give as well as take. Even its smell was different. How long he stood he did not know, but there was a foolish and yet delicious sense of knowing himself as an animal come from the forest, drawn by the fire. He was a thing of brush and liquid eye, of fur and muzzle and hoof. He was a thing of horn and blood that would smell like autumn if you bled it out on the ground. He stood a long, long time, listening to the warm crackle of the flames. There was a silence gathered all about that fire. And the silence was in the men's faces, and time was there. Time enough to sit by this rusting track under the trees, and look at the world and turn it over with the eyes, as if it were held to the center of the bonfire, a piece of steel these men were all shaping. It was not only the fire that was different, it was the silence. Montag moved towards the special silence that was concerned with all of the world. And then the voices began and they were talking, and he could hear nothing of what the voices said. But the sound rose and fell quietly, and the voices were turning the world over and looking at it. The voices knew the land and the trees and the city which lay down the track by the river. The voices talked of everything, and there was nothing they could not talk about. And he knew from the very cadence and motion and continual stir of curiosity and wonder in them. And then one of the men looked up and saw him, for the first or perhaps the seventh time, and a voice called to Montag. All right, you can come out now. Montag stepped back into the shadows. It's all right, the voice said. You're welcome here. Montag walked slowly toward the fire, and the five old men sitting there, dressed in dark blue denim pants and jackets and dark blue suits. He did not know what to say to them. Sit down, said the man who seemed to be the leader of the small group. Have some coffee? He watched the dark steaming mixture pour into a collapsible tin cup, which was handed him straight off. He sipped it gingerly and felt them looking at him with curiosity. His lips were scalded, but that was good. The faces around him were bearded, but the beards were clean, neat, and their hands were clean. They had stood up as if to welcome a guest, and now they sat down again. Montag sipped. Thanks, he said. Thanks very much. You're welcome, Montag. My name's Granger. 
He held out a small bottle of colorless fluid. Drink this, too. It'll change the chemical index of your perspiration. Half an hour from now, you'll smell like two other people. With the hound after you, the best thing is bottoms up. Montag drank the bitter fluid. You'll stink like a bobcat, but that's all right, said Granger. You know my name, said Montag. Granger nodded to a portable battery TV set by the fire. We, we've watched the chase. Figured you'd wind up south along the river. When we heard you plunging around out in the forest like a drunken elk, we didn't hide as we usually do. We figured you were in the river when the helicopter cameras swung back in over the city. Something funny there. The chase is still running. The other way, though. The other way. Let's have a look. Granger snapped the portable viewer on. The picture was a nightmare, condensed, easily passed from hand to hand, in the forest all wearing color and flight. A voice cried. The chase continues north in the city. Police helicopters are converging on Avenue 87 and Elm Grove Park. Granger nodded. They're faking. You threw them off at the river. They can't admit it. They know they can hold their audience only so long. The show's got to have a snap ending, quick. If they started searching the whole damn river, it might take all night. So they're sniffing for a scapegoat to end things with a bang. Watch. They'll catch Montag in the next five minutes. But how? Watch. The camera, hovering in the belly of a helicopter, now swung down at an empty street. See that, whispered Granger? It'll be you right up at the end of that street as our victim. See how the camera is coming in? Building the scene. Suspense. Long shot. <clears throat> right now, some poor fellow is out for a walk. A rarity. An odd one. Don't think the police don't know the habits of queer ducks like that. Men who walk mornings for the hell of it, or for reasons of insomnia. Anyway, the police have had him charted for months. Years. Never know when that sort of information might be handy. And today, it turns out, it's very usable indeed. It saves face. Oh God, look there. The men at the fire bent forward. On the screen, a man turned a corner. The mechanical hound rushed forward into the viewer suddenly. The helicopter light sh shot down a dozen brilliant pillars that built a cage all about the man. A voice cried, There is Montag. The search is done. The innocent man stood bewildered, a cigarette burning in his hand. He stared at the hound, not knowing what it was. You probably never knew. He glanced up at the sky and the wailing sirens. The cameras rushed down. The hound leapt up into the air with a rhythm and a sense of timing that was incredibly beautiful. Its needle shot out. It was suspended for a moment in their gaze, as if to give the vast audience time to appreciate everything. The raw look of the victim's face, the empty street, the steel animal and bullet nosing the target. Montag, don't move, said a voice from the sky. The camera fell upon the victim, even as did the hound. Both reached him simultaneously. The victim was seized by the hound and the camera in a great spidering, clenching grip. He screamed. He screamed. He screamed. Blackout. Silence. Darkness. Montag cried out in silence and turned away. Silence. And then, after a time of the men sitting around the fire... Their faces expressionless, an announcer on the dark screen said, The search is over. Montag is dead. A crime against society has been avenged. Darkness. We, not, we now take you to the Sky Room of the Hotel Lux for a half hour of just before dawn, a program of Granger turned it off. They didn't show the man's face in focus, did you notice? Even your best friends couldn't tell if it was you. They scrambled it just enough to let the imagination take over. Hell, he whispered. Hell. Montag said nothing, but now, looking back with his eyes fixed to the blank screen, trembling. Granger touched Montag's arm. Welcome back from the dead, Montag nodded. Granger went on. You might as well know all of us now. This is Fred Clement, former occupant of the Thomas Hardy Chair at Cambridge in the years before it became an atomic engineering school. The other is Dr. Simmons from UCLA, a specialist in Ortega y Gasset. 
Professor West here did quite a bit for ethics, an, an ancient study now, for Columbia University quite some years ago. Reverend Padova, over, Reverend Padova here gave a few lectures 30 years ago and lost his flock between one Sunday and the next for his views. He's been bumming with us for some time now. Myself, I wrote a book called The Fingers and the Glove, The Proper Relationship Between the Individual and Society, and here I am. Welcome, Montag. I don't belong with you, said Montag at last, slowly. I've been an idiot all the way. We're used to that. We all made the right kind of mistakes, or we wouldn't be here. When we were separate individuals, all we had was rage. I struck a fireman when he came to burn my library years ago. I've been running ever since. You want to join us, Montag? Yes. What, what have you to offer? Nothing. I thought I had part of the book of Ecclesiastes, and maybe a little of Revelation, but I haven't even that now. The book of Ecclesiastes would be fine. Where was it? Here, Montag touched his head. Ah, uh, Granger smiled and nodded. Oh, what's wrong? Isn't that all right, said Montag. Better than all right. Perfect. Granger turned to the reverend. Do we have a book of Ecclesiastes? One. A man named Harris of Youngstown. Montag, Granger took Montag's shoulder firmly. Walk carefully. Guard your health. If anything should happen to Harris, you are the book of Ecclesiastes. See how important you've become in the last minute? But I've forgotten. No, nothing's ever lost. We have ways to shake down your clinkers for you. But I've tried to remember. Don't try. It'll come when we need it. All of us have photographic memories, but spend a lifetime learning how to block off the things that are really in there. Simmons here has worked on it for 20 years. Now we've got the method down to where we can recall anything that's been read once. Would you like someday, Montag, to read Plato's Republic? Of course. I am Plato's Republic. Like to read Marcus Aurelius. Mr. Simmons is Marcus. How do you do, said Mr. Simmons. Hello, said Montag. I want you to meet Jonathan Swift, the author of that evil political book, Gulliver's Travels. And this other fellow is Charles Darwin, and this one is Schopenhauer, and this one is Einstein, and this one here at my elbow is Mr. Albert Schweitzer, a very kind philosopher indeed. Here we all are, Montag, Aristophanes and Mahatma Gandhi, and Gautama Buddha, and Confucius, and Thomas Love Peacock, and Thomas Jefferson and Mr. Lincoln, if you please. We are also Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Everyone laughed quietly. It can't be, said Montag. It is, replied Granger, smiling. We're book burners, too. We read the books and burnt them. Well, we read the books and burnt them, afraid they'd be found. Microfilming didn't pay off. We were always traveling. We didn't want to bury the film and come back later. Always the chance of discovery. Better to keep it in the old heads, where no one can see it or suspect it. We are all bits and pieces of history, and literature, and international law. Byron, Tom Paine, Machiavelli, or Christ. It's here. And the hour is late, and the war is begun. And we are out here, and the city is there, all wrapped up in its own coat of a thousand colors. What do you think, Montag? I think I was blind trying to do things my way planting books in firemen's houses and sending in alarms. <clears throat> you did what you had to do. Carried out on a national scale, it might have worked beautifully. But our way is simpler and, we think, better. All we want to do is keep the knowledge we think we will need intact and safe. We're not out to incite anger... No, we're not out to incite or anger anyone yet. For if we are destroyed, the knowledge is dead, perhaps for good. We are model citizens in our own special way. We walk the old tracks, we lie in the hills at night, and the city people let us be. We're stopped and searched occasionally, but there's nothing on our persons to incriminate us. The organization is flexible, very loose and fragmentary. Some of us have had plastic surgery on our faces and fingerprints. Right now we have a horrible job. We're waiting for the war to begin and as quickly end. 
it's not pleasant, but then we're not in control. We're the odd minority crying in the wilderness. When the war is over, perhaps we can be of some use in the world. Do you really think they'll listen, then? If not, we'll just have to wait. We'll pass the books on to our children by word of mouth, and let our children wait, in turn, on the other people. A lot will be lost that way, of course, but you can't make people listen. They have to come round in their own time, wondering what happened, and why the world blew up under them. It can't last. How many of you are there? Thousands on the roads, the abandoned rail tracks tonight. Burns burns on the outside, libraries inside. It wasn't planned at first. Each man had a book he wanted to remember and did. Then, over a period of twenty years or so, we met each other, traveling, and got the loose network together and set out a plan. The most important single thing we had to pound into ourselves was that we were not important. We mustn't be pedants. We were not to feel superior to anyone else in the world. We're nothing more than dust jackets for books, of no significance otherwise. Some of us live in small towns. Chapter 1 of Thoreau's Walden and Green River. Chapter 2 in Willow Farm, Maine. Why, there's one town in Maryland, only 27 people. No bomb will ever touch. That town is the complete essays of a man named Bertrand Russell. Pick up that town almost and flip the pages. So many pages to a person. And, and, and when the war's over, some day, some year, the books can be written again. The people will be called in one by one to recite what they know, and will set it up in type until another dark age, when we might have to do the whole damn thing over again. But that's the wonderful thing about man. He never gets so discouraged or disgusted that he gives up doing it all over again, because he knows very well it's important and worth the doing. What do we do tonight? asked Montag. Wait, said Granger, and move on downstream a little way, just in case. He began throwing dust and dirt on the fire. The other men helped, and Montag helped, and there in the wilderness the men all moved their hands, putting out the fire together. They stood by the river in the starlight. And I think that's where I'll end for now. Where they're standing by the river in the starlight. It's a good read, and there are perhaps 40 of these pages left. Um, don't know if that's more or less on actual book pages, but yeah. I might well be able to finish this in another part, so let's hopefully keep an eye out for part three later. Fare thee well.